This is Thriving in Business and Life. I'm Christopher Harding. And I'm Will Wilkinson. Welcome back to the program. So, Will, last week we were talking about unconscious bias. I remember that very clearly. (laughs) I exposed some of my own, as I recall. (laughs) Yeah, well, we always are, whether we're knowing it or not, right? Um, And I think one of the things that was interesting, if we just backtrack to the one before that, we were talking about the stories we generate in our mind, that we're always imposing meaning onto whatever's happening. Right. And that a lot of times that meaning can actually be infected with what we refer to as the virus of bias, some kind of an implicit unconscious bias that's maybe a social or cultural uh, meme or belief that somehow it slips into our own thinking, our own story, and affects the way we we might treat people, the way we make decisions, uh, how we choose to utilize uh, people, and how we even uh, kind of think about situations. Well, I like the term, the virus of bias, because as you just said, a bias affects a situation. It also infects a situation and viruses spread. So my bias is going to be felt by others and it will tend to stimulate their own. Sure. And that's one of the things that, uh, you know, we we talked about that, for example, if I start to... uh, share stories, so to speak, gossip about somebody based on my perception, it's pretty easy to spread Mm -hmm. a rumor about somebody else or even a perception about somebody else that might limit the way others see them, think about them, and utilize them. Right. So we've gone from stories, telling stories, and acknowledging that bias is part of the reason we tell the stories that we do. And today we're going to talk about the values that are associated with our stories and the way we live our lives. Yeah, so we're going to look at it a little bit different way, perhaps, than values often get looked at. So we we look at, and I'll kind of do a preview, we're going to talk about how to infuse our stories with values right. rather than allowing biases to creep into our stories. So a lot of times values are looked at as things that feel or seem important to me that are more aspirational. Yeah, I remember we covered this in our uh, online program, and I felt it was a very important distinction to talk about values as ideals, because that even the word values tends to conjure up an aspirational, kind of a lofty idea, and that's not necessarily what we're talking about here. Right. I mean, the the words might be the same, but what we're really trying to look at is to move things from the aspirational into the lived. Yes. And to look at it maybe a different way that values aren't things we should be doing, mm-hmm. you know, so that because that's the challenge. The values can become this this list of things I should do but don't do and actually feel like I'm in conflict all the time. So what we look at values as, or we suggest that others do that when we're coaching them as well, is to say, what is it that really lights you up? What excites you? What triggers your passion? What has you feeling most alive? And if those, you know, if those are your values, you could say the things that make you most valuably you, how can you then infuse those into your life? Well, it's fascinating to to dissect this a little bit and uh, analyze the difference between the the aspirational values and the lived values. An example I was just thinking of, a person might say, well, one of my values is discipline. Uh, By that I mean I should go to the gym and work out every Tuesday and Thursday. Well, looking into the way they live their lives, we might find out that what really lights them up is freedom and feeling free to be spontaneous. Well, we've got an obvious conflict there between what they think they should be doing. I should be more disciplined. That's a value that I have. Go to the gym every Tuesday and Thursday. And a lived value, which is I love being spontaneous. Well, so uh, those conflicts can occur, but a lot of times what that's a sign of, as, as you know, is that they've actually got a borrowed value. Right that the borrowed right. value might be discipline in the case you just shared, that it's, it's something they should be doing. I should be going to the gym. I should be more disciplined. And their real deeper sense of what makes them most alive is spontaneity. Well, my wife and I joke about this because we're, we're old enough now that we're suffering that disease that most of us get to at some point in our lives. Namely, we begin to become our parents. <laughs> and we start to see the values that we've borrowed from them and lived unconsciously. And one that my wife and I laugh about frequently is that 
we both come from industrious families. Right. So there was an evening a while back where we were busy in the home doing this, doing that, and we kind of finished, and my wife said, well, what should we do now? And we both started laughing because it was 8 o'clock and we couldn't stop working. <laughs> the value that we had was, well, we're not ready for bed yet, so let's keep working. <laughs> yeah, there's got to be more things to do. <laughs> well, yeah, I, that's one I can certainly share. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's funny, uh, as, as you know, my wife, Leela, is also a coach. She mm-hmm. coaches a lot, of, a lot of people, but a lot of entrepreneurs. And what she tries to help them find is is both a balance between the success of their business and having a life. Yeah. And and <laughs> the two can go together. Yeah. And I, I I'm you know I'm afraid that I would not be a good candidate for coaching for her. Not because I am not in need of balance, but because I'm so resistant to having <laughs> balance. <laughs> <laughs> True confessions right here on the show. <laughs> yeah, but, and it, it's that thing where I grew up with this. I yeah. I could say osmotic or osmosis, right? Osmotically inherited it from my dad. That uh-huh. was the thing was that you were always yeah. driving and passionate about a project, whatever yeah. you were working on. And as a result, I mean, you know, he would be working all hours of day and night on on projects and i saw how passionate he was about it i I later learned uh, that it was both passion and and sometimes fear Mm -hmm. (laughs) that was driving him right but you know that's the hardest thing in the world is for me to really authentically relax and so Mm -hmm. you know i would like to put on my values list Mm -hmm. um you know, relaxing and having wonderful, you know, <laughs> vacation times and so on. And I'm just terrible at it. I literally realized this morning, actually, because we're getting ready to go on a vacation, that I don't know how yeah. to have downtime. Yeah. Well, let's talk about how our listeners can find out for themselves which are their own values and which they may have borrowed. You just gave us a great example of your own discovery, and it pretty obvious uh, <laughs> that you've got a value you, you got from your dad. Um, how do people tell? How, how do you make the, the distinction and learn which are yours and which you've borrowed? Well, so, so let's, let's take a look at that. One thing would be to go through the list and say, what do I think my values are? Mm-hmm. You know, and I can, I can make a list. The next question would maybe be, is that something that's genuinely, mm-hmm. you know, lights me up is that something where i feel alive and really at my best or is it something i feel i have to do well i'm going to state the obvious here that whole process could be torpedoed if you have a strong value against doing anything unless it was worthwhile work because you'd look at that question and say well it doesn't really matter if it lights me up what's important is to get some work done Right. So when we look at uh, at high performance and sustainable high performance and excellent in organizations, what brain science and endocrinology has now shown is that shooting our ways to, to our way to success <laughs> right. is not very effective. Exactly. That people who are sustainably successful are ones who are doing it out of the genuine love and passion mm-hmm. of of what they do and and the quest, you know, for whatever they're heading for. Yeah. Well, the simple test could be to look at the list and just ask, well, how lit up am I as I look at each one of these values? Yeah, yeah. Do I? Does it really have me feeling that? And another one might be, especially if there's one in question, is where did that come from? Right. Did I possibly inherit, borrow, adopt that from someone else? Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the very next question is the difference between even genuine or authentic values and ones that I'm living. Right. Right? So... The way to check whether they're authentic or, or you know, and lived or merely professed is simply look at my day, my mm-hmm. week, my month, and say, where do I spend my time? Yeah, That's where I am focused. And whether I like the reality of how it shows up or not, that tells me, you know, what I consider to be the most valuable. I'm recalling, it may be from one of the blogs we wrote, it could be in the course, that we had an example of a woman who was caught in kind of a dead-end job situation who did this exercise and realized that one of her real values that lit her up was having a lot of fun. And she realized when she looked at her list that 
that was a a professed value that she wasn't living. She wasn't having much fun in her work. And she gave herself permission to, and things yeah. started to radically change. They well, did. I, I had a, a interesting conversation with my dad. Uh, just a few weeks before he died, and mm. we got he was very healthy, and there was no sign that he was going to you know pass on. But we started talking about some of these things, and I, I asked him about why he had spent so much of his life working, and he, you know I knew that that he he had a very high value of of providing for the family, and that was probably top of his list. Uh, whether it was authentic, borrowed, or otherwise, it was a deep sense of purpose that he had, that his job was to make sure we had a roof over our head, food on the table, clothes on our backs, mm -hmm. and that we were taken care of adequately. Yeah, I think it was part of that generation's mindset, really. My my dad was the same. Yeah, and, and I really, I picked that up. If I look at what did I consider to be my primary, you could say, responsibility, and you know, so there was a high value on on the time, was for me to have a career that allowed my family to subsist at a at a good level, mm -hmm. uh, to really be able to have roof over head, food on table. I mean, and it was very unconscious. It was it was something that I did. Now I had another value that I didn't know I had till more recently, and that was that my dad had always limited his own opportunities based on, first of all, what he thought he was capable of. He didn't mm -hmm. have as high a value on himself as others did. Mm -hmm. And so part of my value was I'm going to go out and accomplish all the things that I know I've been given the talent for mm -hmm. that my dad never did. Well, you're reminding me of a, a remarkable book by Robert Johnson who wrote He, We, She called Living Your Unlived Life. And he says that we all carry the burden of living the unlived dreams of our parents. Yeah, well, that was definitely true for me. Um, and it was true for me, too, with my dad. And I, I think it's probably most of the men listening could kind of contemplate a little bit of their lives and think of their dads and recognize an element of truth to this. I think it's a prevailing principle. Yeah, and I, I hear I coach a lot of women executives who have very similar stories to tell themselves about their mother or their dad. And one of the other things I realized for me, and a lot of times, so this is a question of where do values come from. Sometimes they're a reaction to yes. something. So they could be the opposite. Yeah, so, yeah. My, so for example, my mother was always very... Um, basically agoraphobic she mm -hmm. she for a whole host of reasons if you understood her life you'd know why she was afraid to go out of the house um, you know post-traumatic stress would you know provide plenty of answers to that and there wasn't treatment for it really in those days so one of my other values was to be an explorer and to see the world. And that was in right. reaction to her value. Yeah, right. yeah. I'm going to go out and I'm going to see the world. And every time I do, I'm, I'm, I'm overcoming a limitation I had as, as a young person, you know, because of, of the limitation she had, had placed on herself that re had repercussions on us. Well, I wonder if this changes over time. It seems to because I'm thinking of my mother and I was with her for the last week or so of her life, she expressed a lot of regret about not having lived as free a life as she could have. She regretted not just hanging out with her nieces and granddaughters as much as she could have because she stayed industrious to the end. But I recall that in her life story, I helped her write a book out of her diary about her, her life, when she was young, she broke free from her family. Her parents were farmers and worked all the time. And she left home and she went out to the coast in Canada and lived a really free life. So it seemed that she changed over time. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting, too. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times it's in reaction to. So when we're looking at, uh, at where did our values come from? Were they borrowed? Are they in reaction to? Did I inherit them? I mean, those are good questions. And, you know, I'm, I'm focusing on a lot of these things now at this stage of my life that I wish I would have known much younger, of course. Right. But the other part is this. We talk about in one of our modules and chapters about going upstream. Yes, exactly. So I want to just introduce the idea of this exercise into this values conversation because if I looked at my list and said, what is it that really lights me up? 
what is it that genuinely I'm excited about? And and then to say, how do I want to express that? How do I want to live that out? And mm-hmm. what are going to be the repercussions of doing it or not? Mm-hmm. You know, who's going to be affected mm-hmm. by the way I live out well, my let's, values? Well, let's do that right now because you already – surface to value conflict you've got between working really hard and going on vacation. So you're about to head out on a vacation. So why don't you just, uh, you know, let's do this in real time here. Well, so here, here's, here's a value. Here's the you beauty. Would... Yeah, I'm not taking my computer. Uh-huh. I, and okay. I happened to leave it behind, actually, at the at the previous uh, engagement it's I had. It's sitting out week. in Michigan, and you're here in Oregon. So <laughs> yeah. That's so a good start, Chris. That, that won't be hard. <laughs> uh, and, and I went with this same group. It's uh, part of my wife's extended family uh, last summer. And... They're they're great at hanging out, and I really love them, and I love to hang out with them. And so it's easy, it's 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 a good exercise for me to just power down for mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. my gosh, it's seven days, Ooh. or maybe even. Is eight. this going to be a world's record uh, for you? You know, it might be. <laughs> I think eight days off might literally be a world record. That's kind of sad to say. I am betting that the world is going to keep turning. The world will be just fine, you know. <laughs> and that's the thing is a lot of times we create a false sense of urgency yeah, for right, ourselves right. if if you happen to be kind of a workaholic. Now, the other thing that's happening is I'm going to be going, you know, back to the city where two of my sons live uh-huh. and my daughter-in-law and grandkids uh-huh. uh, the, the last week of, of August and getting a chance to spend time there. Um, what's interesting is, is that's actually when I think about what makes me feel good, mm-hmm. that the time I spend, and they've got very busy lives as well, but the time I get to hang out and spend with them is actually something that sticks longer with me mm-hmm. than probably one of mm-hmm. few other things that I do in my life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so we live, you know, 12 hours away from them by car. Yeah. And my other son uh, lives equally distant and so I'm going to get a chance to see him potentially the week before because of a business trip Mm, and so yeah I mean those are things that I know for the well-being of my soul Mm -hmm. uh, are important for me. Well let's translate this for our listeners who you know probably would like to realign their lives with their values. Let's give them a few bullet points here for how they actually do it. I know we've got our list that we use, identify our values, look at what lights you up, what doesn't, see what's your professed value and what's your lived value. What else can they do? Well, the other one we've talked about is infusing your values. So, for example, um, let's say that creativity is one of my values and I have a lot of mundane aspects, a lot of meetings maybe I have to go to on my profession. What we're talking about is when we walk into a situation, when we're planning our day, if I've got this list of, of truly authentic values, to say, well, what value can I, uh, I think you used the term, what value can I smuggle into this situation? Yeah, right. What value could I infuse into this that's on my list that doesn't necessarily look like mm-hmm. it would go with this next activity? So to well, well, intentionally it, do that. Yeah, here's an example from my life. This was a number of years ago. I found that I was relying on my wife to make meals when I was at home. I have an office at home as well as in town. And I'd be busy on a project and, you know, I'm starting to get hungry. It's one o'clock. I want lunch. So I'm expecting her to make the lunch. And she's very gracious. She did that. She had the time to do it. But I started to realize it was a bit unfair because on some days, at least, I could make the lunch for the two of us. And I went into the kitchen and I am standing there going, you know, I'd really rather be in my office sitting at my computer (laughs) getting some real work done. And here I have to make lunch. And I made a decision. I I remember this. Well, one of my values is creativity, as you were saying a moment ago, Chris. How can I be creative in the kitchen? And what helped me was that I put on an apron. And I took a moment to take on the identity of a world-class chef. And I wasn't just making lunch because my wife wouldn't. I was beginning a creative endeavor to fashion a terrific lunch, which I did. I had a great time making it. I presented it really nicely. My wife thought it was incredible. And since that day, I've had a lot more fun being creative in the kitchen. (laughs) That's a great example. You know, 
What's also there, I mean, I mean, I just I have to call this on myself as well. Isn't it interesting how when we have been culturally set apart as not being the one who has to do lunch, <laughs> right? <laughs> that we're actually upset when we have to actually provide food for ourselves from the kitchen, and that that we, I, I mean, that we have the freedom, you could say, or the privilege to be to then say well how can i be creative Mm -hmm. imagine and maybe you do this now if that was the role we took on Mm -hmm. every single day to where it would become could become easily routine Mm -hmm. boring Mm -hmm. um you know the ability to infuse creativity into it would be far more challenging Mm -hmm. and so you know that's where it comes into having this conversation about values with with our partners in life and saying, "Wow, um, what are your values mm-hmm. and the way we're living?" You know, are you able to realize what's what's important to you? Well, I think the adventure here is to go deeper in our lives, and self inquiry is a a tremendous tool for learning, for growth, and also for feeling young. I think when we keep asking questions about life, it keeps us feeling young. In the in the example I used with uh, myself and my wife, one of the things we uncovered was that her, her father had a habit of demanding the meals. Like he would come home from a hard day's work and where's supper? And, you know, his wife, oh, wow. my wife's mother was scurrying around to make dinner for husband and five kids. And it was a real expectation, a demand. And he got very, very angry if things didn't suit his tastes. So when I was going through my revelation and getting a hold of being responsible and living my value of creativity in the kitchen, as she noticed that, we uncovered this issue that she had grown up with as a child, and we were able to actually do some healing around that for her because she had scary memories of her dad taking his plate of food and throwing it at the wall. Oh, my in disgust. He also was an alcoholic, so I'm sure that contributed to it. But my point here is that the self-inquiry I did and then my wife did in this situation around values led to actually something healing in her relative to a childhood memory, and it ended up being really a valuable exploration. You know, wow, that's that's a powerful story and one I didn't know about uh, your wife. That just brings up all kinds of compassion for having had to grow up that and it makes me feel tremendously grateful that that I didn't have to deal with that as as a kid there were you know there's dysfunction and neurosis in every house but some are more extreme and uh, you know I I think about also something that you had mentioned when we were writing our book on the chapter on values and that was to not only look at how can I infuse values into activities, but how can I purposely, as if I look at a week, and say which activities can I select this week to make sure that I am clearly, purposefully living out that value. And mm-hmm. so that would be, we suggest having maybe just a list of five or six, so mm-hmm. it doesn't become this huge laundry list. Mm-hmm. Of the core values that are most foundational and that are the, have the deepest meaning to you personally. And then look at the activities in the week and choose activities that are going to touch on each of those in a very meaningful way. Now that's a that's an exercise I'm still working on because unfortunately, you know, in terms of balance goes, my value about getting things done and accomplishing business purposes is so high on my list <laughs> that other things... <laughs> it eclipses everything else. <laughs> it does. It does. And it's a real... I mean, we had a service dog for years that, that would make me do things. You know, I would have to go out and go out on walks and have breaks and do all these kind of things. Uh, you know, my my wife is regularly... You know, the one who, uh, you know, is a balancer in in our life. So this is a a personal challenge for me is here I am. Okay, great. Whatever success I'm having in in business, wonderful. But how much am I really infusing my life with the values that when I am dying, 
you know, I'm going to look back and go, wow, I'm glad I spent more time yeah. doing that. Yeah. Well, I'm going to bring up an awkward point here, at least for you and me and some of the people listening who are in the people helping business like we are. What I've noticed about myself is the unfortunate tendency to begin translating what I share with clients as what I'm doing in my own life. <laughs> right. Now, this right. is a big admission to make, and I, I think we've noticed this often in leaders. They're not necessarily walking their talk, yet just speaking for myself, I can assume that I am if I'm talking about it with clients. Or, or now, That's quite an admission to make there, because being honest, I, I, I have to go, well, I can talk about this, I can present it, I can write it. Am I living it to the extent that I'm encouraging my clients to live it? Yeah, I was going to say it, it's, it really is kind of the epitome of a professed value because we're yeah. professing it regularly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and part of that, too, is there's some transference in a, in a way that's taking place. I'm professing the value to someone else. I'm encouraging them to do it. They do it. They start to have the joy of it. Vicariously, I'm enjoying that value yeah, exactly. being lived out as if it was me. <laughs> right. I'm remembering the story about a woman who took her young son to some, uh, I think he was a guru in India or something, and she said, uh, my son is eating candy all the time. Please tell him to stop eating candy. And the uh, the teacher said, bring him back next week. So she brought him back next week, and the teacher said to the boy, stop eating candy. He said, well, why didn't you just tell him that last week? And he said, well, last week I was eating candy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, so I guess it can work that way, too. You know, we can be inspired by a need that's brought to us that reminds us of something we have yet to do in ourselves. Well, and that's that's certainly true. I, I, I like to think I'm making some progress, however incrementally, uh, towards better living the principles that we've discovered, have been shown to us, that we're, we encourage others to live but you're right I mean every time we talk about this 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 for me this particular one is probably um, I think one of the biggest challenges mm -hmm. out of the 12 practices we have yeah. uh -huh. is to really live a more balanced life in terms of my values yeah. and and really creating uh, more time for the things that are truly important versus the ones that are superficially important well and, and I want to just commend you in, in saying these things because I think what you're epitomizing here is the kind of leadership we really ascribe to which is looking at ourselves really honestly. The old model of the leader is the perfect guy, usually a man, who never does anything wrong. Well, <laughs> we know wh where that goes. So the new kind of leadership, which we call leading from the circle, is more of a team play, which starts with being honest about ourselves. And I know that's a point we wanted to make in this program. How do we help others infuse values into their lives? And I think we just nailed number one, being honest about ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what we want to do is encourage you, if you've got uh, your own stories or ideas about uh, values for this week or other aspects of thriving, uh, please write us at thrivinginbusinessandlife at gmail.com. I'm Christopher Harding. And I'm Will Wilkinson. We love hearing from you. And we'll talk to you again next week. Mm -hmm.